So my journey to work on climate change over the past decade wound, uh, took me through 25 years of working on all of the really great mainstream public health issues, in, largely in America, but many of these same issues affect people around the world. And one thing that I learned through that journey is all of the incredible public health victories that we have made, um, to the extent that communication was a part of the victory, and I would contend that communication is always a part of our victory in public health, we have learned one really important thing. As Megan was saying, it's the power of simple, clear messages repeated often by a variety of trusted voices. Every public health victory you can personally bring to mind, I promise you, this was at the heart of the strategy. It wasn't the entire strategy, but it was an incredibly important part of the strategy. When I say simple, clear messages, the reason why that is so important is because of the way the human mind works. It's a paradox of communication that the less we say, the more we're heard. So we've heard a lot today. We've heard a lot of complicated information today. It's all important, but it falls directly into that conundrum of hearing too much. It's simply difficult for us as human beings to process it. My dear friend and mentor, Baruch Fischhoff, likes to say, he's a, one of the world's leading experts on risk communication. He likes to say that, um, what does he like to say, Ed? Um, <laughs> here we go, I got it. <laughs> he says that, that people simplify. Our role as risk communicators is to help people simplify appropriately, okay? And so the less we say, the more Con the, the simpler, more concrete we can be in what we choose to say, the more we can help people simplify appropriately. Which takes me to the second point on this slide, is that um, if we can only say a few things and still be heard, we have to put our vo trusted voices behind the saying the things that are going to have the most value. Which takes me to the final point on this slide. The best asset we have in identifying the facts, the information that is going to have the most value is research, um, audience research. I don't expect all of you to run out and do any of it, but that's okay because actually I'm going to, this is my day job. I'm going to suggest to you what my audience research has found are the things that are gonna have the most value, the simple, clear ideas that will have the most value when we, as a health community, use our trusted voices to repeat them often. Let me take one step back, though, and tell you what we've learned about the way Americans, and I realize America is a big, diverse place, um, but there is a bit of, more than a bit of commonality as to the way Americans see the issue of climate change. We see it as distant, distant in space. It's somewhere else, maybe, it's not here. We see it in distant in time. It's a future threat. It's not a present reality. And we see it as distant from us as the human species. We see it as a plants, penguins, and polar bears problem, not a people problem. The average American sees climate change, as I've already said, as an environmental, plants, penguins, and polar bears threat. They see it as a political problem. They see it as a scientific problem. They don't see it as a people problem. And this is where we, health professionals, come in. It is our opportunity, it is our responsibility to reframe the issue away from these frames that do not engage. One third of Americans engage in environmental issues. The environmental threat is very motivating to a third of Americans. But that means it is not very mo motivating to two thirds of Americans. Um, all Americans are motivated by their a deeply held sense of health as a value. So the language that you speak is a language that will engage every American. And the third and final point on this slide is what we've learned about what Americans understand about the health relevance of climate change. I'll, I'm gonna simplify my own data and say nine out of 10 Americans understand Zippo. Nothing, not a thing. Top of mind, they cannot answer my question, in what ways is, glo is global warming bad for the health of Americans? Shoulder shrugged by nine out of 10 people. Um, and in who, which Americans, if any, are most 
likely to be harmed or are currently most being harmed by climate change, again, nine out of 10 people, no clue, none. Um, again, it's because they don't yet understand this is a people problem. It's a human problem, it's a public health problem. They see it, as I've already said, as a plants, penguins, and polar bear problem, a, an environmental problem. They see it as a scientific problem, which is inherently off-putting to most people because most people are not terribly scientifically literate. It's complicated, it's confusing, and they don't really want to think about that. Even more off-putting is they see it as a political problem, and, and you know, in politics, you're either with us or you're against us. Um, and this is really, really a part of our problem today. Yes, I've heard many times today, and I agree with the, the statement that this is a political problem, but that is not the best way to engage the public in it. They already understand it's a political problem, and they don't want to hear any more about the politics. This is what they want to hear about. They want to hear about the way climate change affects them, their family, their loved ones, their friends, their neighbors. It, if it's not about us, they're probably not going to be listening. So I, I said before, I made a statement before about what the public thinks. You know me well enough, even in the past five minutes, to know I don't really believe there's such a thing as the public with regard to global warming. We've identified six distinct views about in the public, resident in the public, about global warming. We call them Global Warming Six Americas. I'm not going to go over all six. I just want to introduce you very briefly to the two end points on this continuum. On the left, we've got a group that, are called the that we call the alarmed. Um, currently about 13%, they completely get the fact that climate change is bad, um, human caused, serious. Fortunately, most of them to some degree believe it's solvable. Um, on the other end of the continuum, we've got a group that we call the dismissive. They are the equal and opposite. Um, equal in the sense that they too are currently about 13% of the public, opposite in the sense that they have reached the exact opposite conclusion of the alarmed. They don't believe it's real. If it is real, it's certainly not human caused. And even if it really is real and human caused, it isn't a threat. The five key beliefs that determine, that largely determine where a person falls on that Six Americas continuum are the five key beliefs on the left-hand side of this slide. Um, I can do it in 10 words. It's real, meaning global warming is real, it's human caused, it's serious for us, not just plants, penguins, and polar bears, it's solvable, or as I sometimes like to say, there's hope. Um, Megan's point, which is so important. Um, and then the most fundamental belief of all, which is over on the extreme left-hand side of this slide, experts agree. Experts agree that human-caused climate change is happening. The reason why that one is so fundamental is because it has been the single mess, the opposite of that, experts don't agree, has been the number one talking point of the climate denial campaign for the past 15 years. They have put a lot of time and energy into convincing us that there's a lot of disagreement among the experts. Therefore, it would be premature for us to allocate public resources or even private resources to address a problem until the experts decide. Well, for the average American, for almost all Americans, for whom this is a very complicated, confusing issue, as long as they believe experts disagree, it is a perfect excuse for them not to pay attention. And oh, let me actually walk you through the current data on, on these five key beliefs. So currently, as of spring of this year, our most recent survey showed that 63% of the public believes it's real. Only 52% of the public believes climate change is human caused. Only 9% of the public estimates the scientific agreement at 90% or more. The scientific agreement is actually at very minimum 97% of, of climate scientists are convinced that human-caused climate change is happening, yet only one out of 10 members of the, the public believe it. The average estimate is about 60%. So we're not doing very well on that one. Um, it harms people, only about a third of Americans. And it's solvable only about half of Americans. So I want to take these big five ideas, these five key beliefs, and I want to use them to suggest three key messages that every one of us in this room should be conveying. Simple, clear messages 
that we have an opportunity to repeat often through our trusted voices. I have this wonderful opportunity as an academic. I'm physically embedded in a group of climate scientists, um, which has been the most wonderful thing because I had to personally make the transition from being a public health professional to knowing enough about climate science that I could help figure out how to help the public simplify appropriately. Um, I can tell you that even nine years into this, I'm still feeling a little uncertain about a lot of the details. But the first message that I want you to all use, that I want you to convey with your trusted voices, is that more than 97% of climate scientists are convinced that human-caused climate change is happening. The reason why that is such an important message is A, because we've done lots of research in which we find that not only is this helpful in setting the record straight, it moves public understanding from about 60% to about 80% with one exposure, um, but more importantly, it gives you permission not to go into climate science because you are all health professionals. You are not expected to be climate scientists. Um, and this is your pivot away from having to become a master of a, a complicated topic that you don't have time to master. 97% or more of climate experts are now convinced human-caused climate change is occurring. As a health professional, it clearly signals to me that it's time for me to figure out what I, as a health professional, should be doing about it, which takes us to our second message which is it's bad, it's bad for people. Polluted air, polluted water, climate change are hurting our health badly and it's going to get much worse if we don't take actions to protect ourselves. So that covers the it's bad. And then the final point, Megan's point, there's hope, it's solvable. Every American, families, communities, businesses, states, our nation, Bob was making this point earlier, we can all take steps that will protect our health and our climate. Most fundamentally, we can stop wasting so much energy and we, can, and we can either purchase and use clean energy or we can support its production. Every American can do these things and that is the way we're gonna solve this problem. So the first message is a message of scientific consensus and it's real and it's true, it's human cause. The second message is this is bad for people, the risk is there, it's already harming us in every uh, region of America. That point was ab made abundantly clear in the National Climate Assessment last year. Um, and then the third and final and most important point is there's something we can all do. And when we all do this, it's actually really, it's really easy for us to take these steps. That's it, those are the key messages that will help you appropriately simplify in the minds of the public what this issue means, why you're concerned, why you're concerned about it, what this issue really means in terms of our health, and what we can all do to solve the problem. If you stick with me and go into the communication track after this plenary, um, we're going to, my, my friend Diana Van Vliet and, and others, we're gonna teach you, sort of we're gonna show you how this works out in a, a message box, a way that you can use these messages in interviews with the media, in town hall meetings. Um, uh, and we're not gonna talk about sort of clinical interactions, but more public interactions. And then in the final section of the day, session of the day, we'll teach you how you can use these messages in your visits with legislators tomorrow and beyond. I guess I'm going to stop now, because I'm, I'm Jennifer's being very polite, um, and I'm simply gonna say that be yourself. You, my data shows that you are among the most trusted voices in America. Health professionals are one of the few professions that Americans still trust and respect. You and the military. Think about that. Um, but this is your greatest asset. So be yourself as a health professional and be yourself as a human being, whether that means you're a, a parent, a mother, um, a father, a, a sibling, whomever, a, a child. If you have a, a, a parent who, is, um, who has chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, talk about the fact that, look, I'm really, imp I'm really, really dedicated to cleaning up our air so my father, who has chronic obstructive lung disease, doesn't have to spend as much of the rest of the remainder of his life on an, an oxygen tank. So be yourself. It's the right person. You have the voice we all need to hear. Um, I'm going to have to skip past all of these except this one. I'm going to stop on this one, actually. 
don't go to the dark place. <laughs> yes, it's true, the second message is a message about the dark place, but just take, you know, treat that as a quick stop in the journey to the bright place to the hope, to the solvability, that's the place where you need to spend your time. Because the dark place is a very, very off-putting place. Nobody wants to go there with you, and if you go there, you're going there by yourself. So <laughs> don't do it. Take them there only as a quick stop, and then get them, to, get them to a more hopeful future, the kind of future in which our children who have asthma are less likely to be suffering the kind of asthma attacks that terrify every parent of a child with asthma, um, the, a, a place where we all can breathe clean air, um, a place where we're not wasting energy needlessly, because nobody likes the idea of waste, um, and a place where even the dismissive segment that I introduced you to a moment ago, even they who are absolutely committed, they're only one out of 10 Americans, but they are one out of 10 Americans who are absolutely committed to the notion that climate change isn't happening or isn't real or, or harmful, even they pretty amazingly support the notion that it's a good idea for America to move beyond fossil fuel because dirty fuel pollutes our air and our water, which ultimately harms our health. So even they are totally with us on wasting less energy and pivoting towards clean renewable energy that will be good for all of us. And we, all of us in this room, are the most trusted messengers to take that message forward. It's a message that, that we must use and needs to be heard. So thank you.